Drug cartels are known to be very brutal in dealing with offenders or anyone who gets in their way. It doesn't matter the person's age or gender, these ravaging individuals are always ready to cause violence and inflict pain, even at the slightest provocation. And when they do, they carry it out in one of the most inhumane ways ever. In this video, we will take a look at eight women who got dismembered by cartels. Unnamed girl. The brutal killing of a six-year-old girl while she was still alive sparked media outrage in 2015. Aside from the fact that the little girl was innocent, the manner in which her body was dismembered was terrifying. It clearly indicated how dangerous cartels can be and served as a warning to those who might want to go against them in the future. The six-year-old was butchered with an axe in the presence of her parents as the assassin made them watch so they would remember him. As if that was not enough, he proceeded to cut off her arms and leg, which he burned in a barrel. The brutal killing was carried out by a Mexican drug cartel kingpin, Marciano Milan Vasquez. A 39-year-old man was also made to watch the incident as he was responsible for a missing marijuana shipment that belonged to the Zetas cartel. Vasquez obviously made the witness, who remained anonymous, watch so he could understand to what extent he could go if the missing marijuana shipment was not found. According to the witness's account, the poor girl was dismembered alive, and the parents were forced to watch as their baby girl screamed in agony. The father, mother, and child were all tied up and blindfolded before Vasquez picked the child and started doing unspeakable things to her. He also added that the Los Zetas cartel drug member was laughing as the girl screamed while her limbs were being cut off. He then walked to the father and told him he was doing all that so he would remember him. After forcing the parents to watch their daughter die, he ordered their deaths. Marciano Milan Vasquez is an assassin and drug runner for the Los Zetas drug cartel, one of Mexico's most violent drug cartels. He started as a foot soldier in the cartel, but soon walked his way through the ranks. Eventually, the drug kingpin was promoted to the position of regional manager in Piedras Negras. In case you are not aware, Piedras Negras is a city in Coahuila, Mexico, known to be a den for smugglers and is known for violence. Vasquez operated in the city for many years without restraints, smuggling drugs worth millions of dollars across the border, and no one would dare to confront him, not even the authorities. He wouldn't hesitate to kill anyone who got in his way. According to witnesses, Vasquez worked hand in hand with other cartel leaders and bribed politicians to ensure smooth business. Vasquez was ruthless, and had no emotion for human life. He has, in many cases, forced relatives to watch their loved ones being murdered so he could inflict the cruelest of pain on them. The 34-year-old had been involved in murder, violence, drug and weapons, human trafficking, employing minors in a drug crime, almost every violent crime you could think of. According to a witness, who was a former member of the cartel, Marciano Milan Vasquez was involved in a massacre where 300 people were kidnapped across Coahuila and killed. The witness added that the cartel disposed of the bodies either by cooking them, dissolving some in barrels of acid, or burning the rest with diesel fuel. It is believed that Vasquez is responsible for the murder of at least 29 people between January 2009 and July 2015, all thanks to his affiliation with Los Zetas, a drug gang that operated in northern Mexico between 2009 and 2015. The Zetas gang was initially a member of the Gulf Cartel, a deadly and large criminal organization founded in the mid-1980s. The Gulf Cartel was infamous for its intimidation of the populace and violence. In 1999, the Gulf Cartel began to recruit military personnel who belonged to the Mexican Army Special Force. The purpose was to stand out from rival cartels and maintain their supremacy as Mexico's most powerful cartel. The organized crime gang started with 31 men at the beginning, many of which were enticed by the salaries. They were offered a price higher than what they earned in the Mexican Army to join the new criminal paramilitary wing. The military defectors served majorly as bodyguards and assassins for the Gulf Cartel. The Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel partnership between 2001 and 2008 was successful and they were collectively known as La Compañía, which means the company. The creation of the Los Zetas ushered in a new dawn for drug trafficking in Mexico, and at the time, the Gulf Cartel didn't know they were in for a long ride. The gang became more sophisticated as a result of the advanced military training orientation of its members. This was a major challenge for the US agencies trying to crack down on drug cartels in Mexico. The name Los Zetas translates to the Zs in Spanish, which were the code names given to all their leaders, all of which began with the letter Z. The Los Zetas gang began to grow independently and in 2002, they struck out on their own during a division in the Gulf Cartel, while other gangs worked deals using violence as their last resort.
resort, the Zetas adopted torture and terror as their mode of operation. The crime syndicate was known for beheading and torture, and never discriminated during murders. They cared less about gender or age. This explains why Vasquez probably got the courage to dismember a six-year-old. In no time, the group of military deserters became an organized crime gang that created violence in northern Mexico. At one point, the Los Zetas cartel became the largest and most expansive drug cartel in Mexico by territory, overtaking the Sinaloa cartel, a rival gang. In 2009, the US government described the Los Zetas gang as the most technologically advanced, sophisticated, and dangerous cartel operating in Mexico. In 2010, the Zetas murdered 72 illegal immigrants in San Fernando who refused to work for them. They also demanded money from the immigrants as a way to buy their freedom. Those who refused work and couldn't pay to be released were killed with their bodies dumped in a mass grave. The images of the victims shocked the outside world and illustrated how brutal medical cartels can be. La Flaca. Jocelyn Alejandra Nino was a female Mexican cartel assassin who was murdered by a rival gang. Before her murder, the hit woman belonged to the Gulf Cartel, the old criminal syndicate operating in Tamaulipas, Mexico. She was often called her alias La Flaca, which means the skinny one in English. La Flaca first became an internet sensation when a video of her holding a modified M4 assault rifle with an innocent smile on her face hit social media. The post identified the female assassin as a member of the Gulf Cartel branch based in Rio Bravo, a town in Tamaulipas. She appeared as a lady in her late teens and at most in her early 20s. It was quite surprising how a lady that young could have ranked high in the cartel. The leak, however, was suspected to have been the handiwork of the Los Metros gang, a rival gang to the Los Ciclones, the faction La Flaca belonged to. The purpose of leaking the picture was to attract the authorities so their rivals would get arrested. Organized crime syndicates in Mexico around the time used the trick to lure the authorities or rival gangs to their rivals' doorsteps. On the 13th of April 2015, just a few months after the post went viral, La Flaca was found dead just over the Mexican border in the back of a truck. According to the authorities, her body was dismembered and stuffed in a beer cooler. Two other dead bodies were also found next to hers, a male and female who also shared a similar fate with the Sicario. The male victim's head was cut off while the other female victim was dismembered. The two victims found next to Nino's dead body are suspected to have been a member of the Los Ciclones, the faction Nino belonged to. Signs of torture were found on the bodies of the victims. It is suspected that the perpetrators tried to extract information about their criminal activities before ending their lives. Investigators believe that La Flaca was executed with a gunshot before the perpetrators proceeded to dismember her body. Identifying the female assassin was not hard for the authorities as they discovered a right forearm with a tattoo that read Nino in one of the coolers. The perpetrators added a written message close to the bodies where they threatened other Los Ciclones. This will happen to all the f who support Los Ciclones. Keep sending these f the message read. They also criticized the gang for using females as foot soldiers. La Flaca is believed to have been murdered by members of the Los Metros gang since they controlled the turf where Nino was based. Moreover, Nino's group was tasked with preventing the dominance of the Los Metros gang in the area. The gang reportedly posted pictures of Nino's dismembered body on Twitter, indirectly sending a warning to other members of her gang. However, according to some other sources, Nino was killed by a cartel female assassin known as La Gladys of the Zetas cartel, who went to the winds after terror terrorizing the communities of northern Mexico. La Flaca, like other young female assassins, worked her way through the rank. In most cases, they start working as low-level lookout workers or prostitutes. In some cases, some of these women were born into cartel families or recruited from prisons. Sometimes, the women are lured into the world of violence by the millionaire lifestyle of drug gang members. After years of being loyal to the cartel, they eventually get promoted to foot soldiers like Nino. Nino was the third string of sicarias. That went under the nickname La Flaca. The first was Veronica Mireya Moreno of the Los Zetas cartel, who got arrested in 2011 while driving a stolen car. The second female assassin to go under the name was Nancy Manriquez Quintana, who also got arrested that same year. Using women as enforcers in the cartel became a trend after they discovered that women make more effective agents than their male counterparts. You'd rarely suspect a woman of cartel-related activity. As a result, they have been able to execute killings and kidnappings successfully without raising any suspicion. They keep a low profile by pretending to be a prostitute so they can carry out some of the heaviest crimes crimes without being noticed. Today, the trend has been adopted by almost all of Mexico's major drug cartels. All major drug syndicates in Mexico now have ladies who they refer to as flaca as part of their death squads. Gone are the days when the woman's traditional role in drug trafficking was to raise the kids and launder money for the men. Women now take leadership positions in cartels and execute drug trafficking and assassinations. In most cases, the ladies are usually deployed for missions that require stealth infiltration 
rather than brute force. With their girly look and build, they easily slip through rival gangs and, most importantly, the authorities. The Mexican drug war, which began in 2007, also made the flacas more valuable. They were often deployed for missions considered too dangerous for their male counterparts. Aside from pretending like normal Mexican girls to carry out missions, the flacas sometimes go through plastic surgeries so they can easily attract the attention of the opposite sex. The mass murder of men also reportedly added to the feminization of the drug war. Many of these young girls get widowed or fall short of opportunities. As a result, they dabble in the world of crime. In 2016, a female assassin known as La Peque was arrested after she claimed she drank the blood of her victims and even had intimacy with their dead bodies. The member of the Sinaloa cartel is currently serving her life sentence at the Baja California Sur prison. However, as the trend grew stronger, they began to target other female sicarios who belonged to rival cartels, the same way male gang cartel members target one another. They seek to be the most ruthless among their group of peers. This was a way to show dominance within their territory. Ingrid Escamilla. In 2020, the ruthless killing and dismembering of a 25-year-old lady who was later identified as Ingrid Escamilla caught the attention of the media, with people calling for a change in Mexico's laws after many media outlets posted gory images of the victim's mutilated body on their front pages. On the 9th of February, 2020, the law enforcement agents stormed Escamilla's home only to be welcomed by her lifeless body, which was lying down on the floor. They also observed that her body had been skinned. Upon careful examination of her skinned body, they also observed that some of her body organs were missing. At the time, the murder was one of the latest of the ongoing string of violent crimes against the female gender in the country. Also spotted on the scene was a 46-year-old man who was covered with bloodstains. The man was considered a suspect since he had bloodstains all over him and was arrested. In some leaked videos and photos which subsequently surfaced after the incident, the 46-year-old admitted to killing Escamilla by stabbing her and skinning her so there would be no evidence left. When questioned further, he revealed that they both had an argument over a matter where Escamilla threatened to kill him. Upon further investigation, the police discovered that the 46-year-old man observed on the scene with bloodstains was indeed Escamilla's husband. Mexico City Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum condemned the event and expressed her support for the families of the victim. She she also revealed that the prosecuting counsel would fight for the maximum sentence against Escamilla's husband when facing the court. The killing was considered femicide by many, and at the time, violent crimes against women were rising in Mexico. However, that was just the beginning, as there was an outage over the manner in which the media handled the matter. Local tabloids and digital news websites went ahead to post leaked sensitive images and videos of her mutilated body on their platforms. Some newspapers were even bold enough to put disturbing images of Escamilla's body on their front pages. One of these papers used a headline that positioned the murder as Escamilla's fault. In no time, pictures of Escamilla's mutilated body taken by first responders to the scene began to spread throughout social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. As expected, the way the media handled the incident didn't go well with many people, especially activists who had been fighting against the rise of femicide in the country. They hit the streets in masses, clamoring for a change in the way cases of violence against women are addressed and reported by the media. The president of Mexico, Andres Lopez, faulted the media on how they addressed the killing on their various websites. The Mexico City Prosecutor's Office was also instructed to investigate the civil servants over how the classified images and videos got leaked, adding that it's a crime to distribute the images of the victim. To ensure justice is served, they set up a panel to launch an internal investigation on six public officials who may have leaked the photographs of the victims. Femicide, the intentional killing of women because of their gender, has been on the rise in Mexico. Mexico in recent years. An average of 10 women are killed in Mexico daily, according to a report. In 2019, about 1,006 cases were reported, unlike 912 cases that were reported in the previous year. It is also believed that femicide has experienced a whooping 137% increase between 2015 and 2021. The most vulnerable sets of women include the elderly and children. The women's rights group believes that only a few murders are considered femicides, and as a result, only a few perpetrators are brought to justice. The institution, in reaction to the leaked images of Escamilla, lambasted the media for refusing to protect the dignity of the victim and their families by posting them on their front pages. Many social media users posted pictures Escamilla took while alive, calling on the media to use those pictures instead when reporting her ill-fated death. 
Prosecutors have also called for a specific law that not only makes it a crime to leak confidential photographs, but also punishes public officers who misuse their positions by disseminating images of crime victims to the public. While investigations were still ongoing as regards how the photographs got leaked, the feminists and concerned women took to the street to express their displeasure over the recent publication of Escamilla's images. On the 14th of February 2020, women in Mexico City hit the streets to protest against gender violence in the country. At least over 200 ladies celebrated their Valentine's Day in the Mexican capital and other cities across the country in solidarity with the victims' families. The army of protesters, which was heavily attended by women, marched to the premises of La Prensa, one of the sensationalist newspapers that first published notes and photographs from the crime scene. The newspaper, in response to the critics, had earlier released a statement that day where they claimed they followed all the protocols. They claimed that they had always reported crimes and murders, which the government preferred to keep from the public. In other words, the paper never admitted to making a mistake by publishing the victim's pictures and stood by its decision. This made their office a target for the fuming protesters who were gathering in the Mexican capital. The protesters could be seen chanting as they marched towards the facility. They also carried placards that read, we demand responsible journalism, and Ingrid, we are all you, amidst other solidarity signs. The agitated protesters stormed the premises and burned vehicles that belonged to the newspaper publication. They also had a clash with the security officers stationed at the gate to prevent them from having access to the paper's offices. The incident caught nationwide attention. The United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women faulted the killing of Escamilla and demanded justice for the families of the victim, Gabriela Lima Santana, on the 20th. 4th of March, 2021, some city council members were clearing a drainage ditch in southern Brazil. As the excavator operator attempted to remove garbage from the gully in Capao de Capao, what looked like the arm of a human being flung out of the waste. The terrified employees watched as it landed in the water and floated on its surface. The body was later confirmed as the remains of Gabriela Lima Santana, a 21-year-old who had been reported missing by her family. Santana, according to a local report, was identified by her DNA and a set of distinctive tattoos which were reported reportedly affiliated with a local gang. The dismembered body of the 21-year-old was discovered inside a black suitcase after the authorities visited the scene. It is suspected that Santana was murdered by another gang in the neighborhood, and her body was cut into pieces to fit into the briefcase. They recovered the victim's head, torso, legs, and arms. The police also found two kitchen knives and a saw in the suitcase. They believe the knives and saw were used to dismember her body by the perpetrators. It appeared that the assailants didn't want her mutilated body to be recovered, as the suitcase also also contained stones that were placed so the bag would sink. On the 13th of March, Gabriela Santana was reported missing. This was a day to her birthday. However, the police believe Santana was already dead before the day she was reported missing. Since Santana was alleged to belong to a local gang, the police believed that her murder was gang-related. They speculated it could have been the aftermath of a retaliation attack from a rival cartel. The discovery of Santana's mutilated body made investigators review a disturbing video they had received earlier where a smiling assassin was seen dismembering a woman on camera. The police linked the murder to the horrifying moment, which was captured on camera by some Brazilian gang members. In the disturbing video they received on March 1st, a woman could be seen being dismembered in a bathroom. Viewers could see several body parts containing the victim's body parts, which were scattered on the bathroom floor. It is, however, unclear how the police got a hold of the footage. The police have also withheld some vital information about the gang responsible for her murder. In the quest to know more about the authenticity of the video, the investigation led the police to an apartment in the neighborhood of Rio Branco, where they arrested one suspect. They also believe that the murder was carried out at the apartment. A 23-year-old who is suspected of recording the clip and a 49-year-old who was allegedly identified from the footage were arrested by the police in affiliation with the incident. As the investigation continues, they are still in search of two other suspects. While it's hard to speculate the exact Brazilian gang behind Santana's death, as there was little or no information about the gang she belonged to, there are a few possible gangs who operate in a similar MO. It could be the work of gangs like Commando Vermelo, or the First Capital Command, the two main gangs in Brazil, or a faction from any of these two gangs which operated in the neighborhood. The Commando Vermelo is one of Brazil's most brutal drug cartels. The violent criminal faction dates back to 1979 and is still in operation to date. The gang was formed when a group of prisoners allied with common criminals and leftist guerrillas. They all met at Candido Mendes, a maximum security prison in Brazil. The prison housed some of Brazil's most dangerous criminals, and to prevent themselves 
themselves from frequent abuse and beatings from the prison wardens, the inmates came together to protect themselves. Soon, the leftist guerrillas who were in the facility, because they were against the capitalist system, began to educate other inmates about resistance. The alliance soon became a big thing in the correctional facility, and the prison authorities decided to break it by moving inmate leaders to different wings. Unfortunately, the outcome was not what they expected, as the separation made the group spread throughout the prison system. As time went on, the Commando Vermelo spread beyond the four walls of the prison. When the military dictatorship ended in Brazil in 1985, the left guerrillas and the CV went their ways completely. However, the alliance created one of the most feared crime syndicates in Brazil today, nicknamed the gang's initials, CV. The criminal organization is involved in almost all criminal activities. Their primary focus includes drug trafficking, arms trafficking, loan sharking, protection racketeering, narco-terrorism, and turf wars. The criminal organization has also been linked to some hijacked armored trucks and kidnapping for ransom. The organized crime gang now has over 30,000 members spread throughout the country. Another possible criminal gang in Brazil that might be responsible for the attack on Santana is the First Capital Command, a gang that shared a similar story with the CV. In fact, they were inspired by the Commando Vermelho, as both criminal organizations were formed by prisoners who sought protection in groups to survive Brazil's ruthless prison system. The PCC, as the gang is also called, was formed in Sao Paulo's Carandiru prison after the prison security force forces killed over 100 prisoners using a riot that occurred as an excuse. The drug cartel now boasts of almost 20,000 members, out of which 6,000 of them are still behind bars. In 2012, a violent clash between the police and the PCC left over 100 people dead. According to reports, the police refused to keep to their end of the bargain by violating an informal truce between the pair. Sao Paulo's public security secretary was later forced to resign during the aftermath of the event. That same year, the crime gang was declared Brazil's largest criminal organization by the Brazilian government. As the investigation continues, the gang responsible for Santan's brutal killing remains unknown. La Guerra Loca and her gang. La Guerra Loca has a similar story to La Flaca, the female cartel assassin who was murdered by a local gang, aside from the fact that they both belonged to the Gulf Cartel. Both ladies were exceptional cartel assassins who were on top of their games. La Guerra Loca was murdered and dismembered alongside some of her gang members, the same way La Flaca was murdered with two victims believed to be members of her gang faction. Yesina Pacheco Ramirez, better known as La Guerra Loca was a female assassin who fought her way through the ranks to become one of the Gulf Cartel's finest operatives. If you remember our brief discussion about women being adopted by cartels, you'd understand why the Gulf Cartel recruited women to go on their toughest missions. La Guerra was one of the first set of women to be recruited by the cartels to kidnap and murder their rivals. Today, La Guerra Loca is considered one of the most ruthless and bloodiest women the world of drug trafficking has ever produced. La Guerra Loca was a famous cartel hitman who dealt with her victims with extreme cruelty before eventually ending their lives. As a result, the authorities declared her an extremely violent person. In 2009, the native of Navalato in Sinaloa was recruited into the criminal world by the Gulf Cartel. La Guerra Loca terrorized the municipalities of Tamaulipas and succeeded exceedingly in dealing with the community. The hitman was bloodthirsty, and this earned her the respect of many, including her several colleagues. As time went by, she began to become famous, all thanks to the unique way she assassinates her victims. The bloodthirsty hitman was so cruel that she dismembered her rivals, or slit their throats. La Guerra Loca soon got recognized by the Gulf Cartel leaders who made her the head of a group of hawks that worked for the cartel. The hawks were tasked with spying and watching over the enemy. Her faction of the Gulf Cartel was called Las Hienas. This made the female assassin one of the first women to head a criminal organization made up exclusively of women. However, her days as a spy soon came to a halt after she was given a bigger mission, or perhaps one of the cartel's greatest missions. Upon assuming the role of a leader, La Guerra Loca and her gang were tasked with assassinating members of the Los Zetas cartel, the Gulf cartel's rival. La Guerra Loca assumed her new role and began to eliminate members of the Los Zetas cartel. The cartel assassin kidnapped and tortured any man that belonged to the Zetas cartel. La Guerra Loca and her team of women would torture their enemies before murdering them, sending a message to other members of the rival group. She wanted to instill fear into them, and it worked. She had such an impact that the Los Zetas panicked among themselves, as many of their members had met their early graves in her hands. At one point, La Guerra Loca became the talk of the town after dismembering a member of the Zetas cartel who operated in Tamaulipas and then peeling off his face using a cutter. Her lack of passion for human life and cruelty earned her a spot on the country's most wanted list. However, Yesenia's dominance in the world of crime came to an end just five years after being promoted to head a faction of the Gulf's cartel. In July 2014, La Guerra Loca's lifeless body was discovered and she was given a taste of her own medicine. It is believed that the Zetas had set up a team that located her and killed her for the damage she did to their gang members. 
there were also obvious signs that proved that she was tortured before dying at her rival's hands. Yesenia's head was cut off, with her body cut into pieces in the retaliation attack. Some days before her dismembered body was discovered, she had been kidnapped alongside three women who belonged to her gang. Not long after her body was found, the Zetas cartel leaked a video where a woman alongside three other women was being eliminated. In the video were La Guerra Loca and her three missing gang members. Before the hooded men ended their lives, La Guerra Loca and her gang members were subjected to an interview. During the interrogation, they gave their names and admitted to working for the Gulf Cartel. They were also forced to describe their roles in the criminal organization. Afterward, they slit La Guerra Loca through with a machete, the same way she does to her victims, before dismembering her. They then abandoned the bodies at the location where they were recovered by the authorities. The rivalry between the Gulf Cartel and the Los Zetas could be traced back to their partnership in the late 90s, before they split in 2010. The then president of the Gulf Cartel, Cardenas, began to recruit military personnel to further strengthen the cartel. The Mexican military personnel who jumped at the offer formed the Los Zetas gang. Both cartels were one until the Los Zetas became too powerful and struck out on their own. Cardenas used the military personnel as bodyguards, and their military experience helped the Gulf Cartel in maintaining its supremacy. This explains why the Los Zetas are military trained and sophisticated today. However, the Los Zetas soon began to expand their operations. They started carrying out murders, theft, extortions, and kidnapping. This was against the Gulf Cartel's operations. The Zetas responded that they carried out murders as sanctified by the Gulf's cartel. When Cardenas was eventually captured and extradited, the Los Zetas grew in his absence, outnumbered the Gulf's cartel, and eventually went their ways. In the process of calling their enforcers back to order, the Gulf's cartel ended up instigating a cartel war. The two cartels have been at it since then, and the rivalry still runs deep in their veins. If you enjoyed this video on women who got dismembered by cartels, you'd definitely love the next video showing on your screen right now.